welcome to the J.R. Hendrick Texan Gentleman, a podcast that deals with the early life of J.R. Hendrick. Now, this is his father on Raynard News' The Approach, February 28, 1996. I'm Greg Sanders, and this is The Approach. A model found dead in New York City as the plot thickens and twists. Congress and gridlock, and progressives and conservatives jockeying for position as the economy hangs in the balance. I'm in the Gainesville, Texas home of James uh, Ryan Hendrick. Jim, how are you, my friend? In many ways, better than I deserve. Jim, I understand you decided to take a leave of absence from Washington, D.C. Can you explain, please explain why? There's a variety of reasons. (coughs) Number one. I learned on the afternoon of the 19th that that morning my Aunt Eunice had passed away in Amarillo when she came down there to her condo to visit my mama. Two days ago, we had a memorial service at the Middle Ocean Assemblies of Christ. There, I hugged some necks and shook some hands. We also had a little wake uh, the following night at my estate in in, uh, in Gainesville. Jim, there are some corners of conservatives wondering why you're not running for um, president in 96 as a third party. And, of course, one media mogul up in California says one word bottomless gate what do you have to say about that I believe it has nothing to do with bottomless gate let me make myself clear to the media I said this early last year I'm saying it now I had nothing to do with the stages and the planning of the bottomless lake deal. That was between my best friend, Claude Gateau, and the wild haired French, uh, Texas French old man, and a compadre of ours, um, Andy Rabbit. Now, it's true though that they, that he put an escrow in your name. Yes, but until I step down from office, it'll be in my wife's name until it is unsealed. Some wondering why your wife wouldn't go to the press. First of all, this is the house in the morning, okay? Her mama passed away a little over three months ago. I just lost my aunt the 19th of February. All right. Now, the attorney, the, the attorneys for my wife, Betsy, will not make her available for comment to the press for any reason. And I have to say it's her husband. I say the same damn thing. Jim, uh, Austin, Texas Congressman, uh, Mike Bradley has placed forward another bill of access to um, education. What do you say about that? (laughs) It was talk at my aunt's wake.
Um, I had relatives in Texas and in Mexico asking for me to cram it through college, cram it through Congress. I told them that I would consider it after consulting with my wife and also consulting with my good aide, Mike Fields, and my press secretary, Timothy Reiner. What do you think is going to be the next step regarding faith-based initiatives? I'll return from my leave of absence, which I have self-imposed for a damn good reason on the 17th. On the 18th, I testified before the House. Okay. At which time, I hope some congressmen on the Republican side are willing to add a little pressure to get it through the Senate, regardless of the machinations of Virginia Congressman Bill Hume. All right. Then on Tuesday, the 19th, I testify uh, before the Senate, before going to an SBA budget hearing. There has to be more reasons than you grieving for why you stepped down. Greg, since you absolutely need to know, anybody that's been in Washington, D.C., for any length of time, can let you know that every once in a while, the city gets to you. It freaks you out. It gets you down, creeps you out. People don't give a damn about nothing. The power game's up there. To bring a man like me down. But yet, you saw me in 93, and you was wanting power, even though you served in the, during the early part of the Bush years. I did serve, and with distinction, I had power as chairman of the CFTC, and contrary to what some little say, who supported the Bill Clinton? I did not have anything to do with any oil expeditions during the time. There's no way I put myself in that in that set of shape. Let me ask you this, though. There's rumors, though, that during your time there that you invested in some gold and silver. Let me make something very, very clear to you. Before I, before I accepted the job and stepped on the scene in D.C. in June 90 of the CFTC, I signed over the certificate of the rights of the silver and the gold to my wife to hold on to I stepped down the power. Greg, you ought to know, I know enough about government ethics and how to avoid a conflict of interest. <laughs> now, there's some in, in, in the D.C. government power grid that says that uh, Philip Leder is trying to play emotional footsie with you. What do you say? I have to say he's a good man. Is he misguided? Yeah. Let's let's face it. In ninety in ninety two, I voted for Bill Clinton, thinking that he was for the common man. Well, sadly, four years from now, I haven't seen it. It's more of the mismatch. Uh, Ivy League class of 68 liberal BS that we all saw. They may, be, may be probably still hold on to date. But, like you and I, Greg, we got, we got snowed. We got played. We got fooled. What do you think about the trial coming up Monday of Jim Guy Tucker and Jim McDougal? I think it's about damn time, if you ask me. I think it's about damn time. 
Because I'll tell you something right now. There are more eyes on that white water thing than there should have been. In, in, in 1995, Seth Stone was sentenced to 15 years in prison. And he, right now, he's currently in the prison of Little Rock. Judge David Kennedy is out of the White House Counsel's Office back home in Little Rock. And guess what? He's kind of sort of sucking up to Clinton, even though Clinton knows he's had. But not Hillary. No, not Hillary. Let me be as bluntly with you as I can be. Bill Clinton, through Hillary, lined up with some mega corporations that were in their back pocket in 92. And I don't think he just planned it in 91, no. Once he won the governor's race in 88, In January of 89, he started a little by little campaigning for president. With Hillary sometimes by his side and sometimes no. You can't, you can't fool me. Of course, in 1990, uh, Bill Clinton picks up uh, Dick Morris to help him out with a few things. And um, unfortunately, he was get maybe a small majority. But he was planning all along to run. And he was backed out by major corporations. That's something for you to consider. You think of some of the people he's got in charge of commerce, a business. Whether or not he wins a second term, I have to be honest with you. It's nothing more than just rearranging the damn chairs of the Titanic. That's what it is. It's rearranging the chairs of the Titanic and Clinton uh, Clinton's trying everything he can to get his damn name on pick to get his damn name and the nomination which he's going to get easy and then he thinks he's got everything in his control which I'll tell you right now Clinton don't know how to earn Dole don't know how to earn. And that's just how it is. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. We're back with a statement about from that limo driver who's supposed to kill that model. And much more. This is the approach. Hope you enjoyed the listen. If you like to hear, please subscribe. Become a part of the adventure. This is the James Hendrick Empowerment Network Things. Until next time. Take care and get ready for the rest of the story. It gets a bit bumpy from here.